So when many of us, Irish anyway, were young, um, one thing that we might have been kind of threatened with or maybe called when we were uh, out of line was bold, right? Don't be bold. Some of us might have thought it was actually our name um, because we were called bold so often. But um, uh, so bold, bold. To be bold, generally in Irish English any, anyway, it has fairly negative connotations, right? To be bold. Uh, it's mentioned twice in our reading today from the Acts of the Apostles. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and help your servants to proclaim your message with all boldness by stretching out your hand to heal and to work miracles and marvels through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. As they prayed, the house where they were all assembled rocked and all were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to proclaim the word of God boldly. Boldly. So boldness is used, the word is used twice and it's used uh, in, a, in a very, very, with a very positive connotation. It's used with a sense of, of courageously. So to, to, to selflessly risk rejection and stand out, and especially, obviously, considering the, the context now in which the apostles are, uh, their preaching will cost them their lives, ultimately. So that's, that's what they're talking about. It's kind of standing out, standing a, a, apart from the crowd, taking a risk and courageously witnessing to what we've seen. And that's what I, I love that idea when it comes to mission and ministry today because um, there can be a danger to try and adjust everything according to a politically correct palette and therefore to adjust our teaching uh, or adjust uh, what the Lord says or what, what the t church teaches uh, according to what people might or might not like. Now, on one hand, um, it's a good missionary tactic to not start with the church's teaching on various aspects of morality because it just leads to fights. I think we establish a relationship with the Lord first. I think you introduce him to the person of Jesus first. As in, we have to get to know the Lord first. Before that, they will actually get to know you. They'll get to know you first as Jesus' representative, as a witness, as a Christian. They'll get to know you first then hopefully through us, they get to know the Lord. And then once they know the Lord, then all the moral teaching, all, all those kind of things, but, but they'll find their place in time. Uh, but if we just start with a moral issue, it's just, it's, it's, I, I find it, I, I, I've, I've never seen it work, actually, uh, basically. But whereas with the light of the Holy Spirit alive in, in the person's heart, they begin to recognize the truth automatically on its own. You know, the, the Holy Spirit illuminates the intellect that we can recognize the truth and then illuminates our will that we can choose the truth that we can do the right thing but without that inspiration the light of the holy spirit it just becomes argu an argument which is kind of pointless introduce them to the lord and do so boldly now uh, i was talking to someone not so long ago and um it was just interesting to hear kind of the different approaches when it came to the faith but um this particular person uh, we were talking about the faith and they, they would always say, do you know what, what you need to do now, right? What you need to do. And then they'd start listing out things. And I just thought, wow, that's really in ineffective. <laughs> it's like when someone kind of always, effectively like pointing the finger at, what you need to, I used to be like you now. I used to be like, I used to be an ignoramus like your good self. And then what I started doing, well, I, started, I started praying now, I started fasting, what you need to do. And like, you know, that's, that's called pontific pontificating, preaching down to someone. Never works, never works. Because the person feels disrespected. That's never, never a good tactic. A person should see Jesus in you. And then we introduce them to, 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 to this, this relationship with the Lord. And then from that then all, as I say, everything else will, will find its place. But we must do so boldly. Tactfully, tactfully, but boldly. And why ultimately is, is that important? Our gospel tells us today that following the Lord, right, following Jesus, isn't just a nice thing to do or it could be advantageous in certain circumstances or it gives us something to do on a Sunday morning or it gives us a reason to celebrate Christmas because if you're a member of another religion, why would you celebrate Christmas? I don't know. But so being... Christian 
has a lot more, there's, there's much more to being Christian than just having a reason for all of these celebrations or uh, a safety net in case, just in case God actually happens to exist, right? That, that's, that's not why we follow Jesus. Jesus, when he's speaking to Nicodemus, he says that it's like a new birth, right? Our faith is actually a new life. It's not just a kind of a better version. It's not just kind of you get an old Ford Fiesta and put big chunky wheels on it and a louder exhaust. No, this is a complete engine rechange. Like this is an engine overhaul, okay? This is a completely different thing altogether. When we follow the Lord, our whole lives are renewed. I tell you solemnly, unless a man is born through the water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So we have to be a sort of born again. We get this new life. And if we, if we don't, then getting into heaven is, is, is a bit of a problem. So, so like this, this, this boldness that we should have, I think we always have to live tactfully with, on, versus, towards this horizon of eternity that we're doing so because we want souls to be saved. We want them to discover this whole new life that there is found only in Christ. I was reading a quotation from St. Augustine earlier, earlier today where he said, we must pray as if everything depends on God, but work as though everything depends on you. So pray as though everything depends on God, but work as though everything depends on you. So we know, ultimately, it's God who changes hearts, not me. It's God who saves souls, not me. So ultimately, we, 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 we pray for people, for their conversion, for their healing, whatever it may be. We pray as though everything depends on God, but we work as though everything depends on us. So we have to do both. We, we work hard, but with this faith that ultimately it's God who changes hearts. It's the Lord who changes souls. It's the Lord who heals. So it's, it's, it's this wonderful balance. So, so the Lord does need, if I can say it that way, does want us to preach, to teach, to witness, and to be bold about doing it, to be courageous, to be tactful, to be loving. But we're motivated by the fact that we want everyone to get to heaven. We want them to have this life in Christ. So when we at this Mass now, think of or pray for our various family members, and especially for anyone out there who might be worried about uh, sons or daughters or nieces or nephews, grandchildren who aren't practicing brothers or sisters maybe, whoever in your family might not be practicing, we pray for them. The Lord is our Saviour, not us. We pray for them. And we witness to them that our faith makes us more joyful, that it makes us more willing to serve. It gives us uh, uh, hope and strength and positivity when the world falls into darkness, negativity and criticism. So we ask the good Lord to renew our faith in this Easter season that each one of us may be filled to overflowing with Easter joy. Amen. <laughs>